Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ansel Peacock. Um, I'm a family medicine doctor out of Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm here today to talk with you all about LGBTQ care. Um, I went to undergrad actually just across the mountain in Banner Elk at Lee's McRae College. Um, then ended up at the University of Pikeville um, for osteopathic school, graduated in 2017. Um, from there, I went to Southeastern Hospital in Lumberton, North Carolina for my traditional rotating internship, and then completed a three-year family medicine um, at Lake Cumberland Hospital in Somerset, Kentucky. I've been practicing about three years now in Knoxville um, on, on the Farragut side. Um, I do full spectrum family medicine. So anywhere from pediatrics to geriatrics, everything in between. Um, I even do osteopathic manipulation therapy as well. So if I can do it, I try to. Um, so I'm here today to talk mainly about um, the LGBTQ care. Um, I try to tailor it more towards the pediatric population since that's probably where you all are more interested than um, than the adults. So um, we'll get this up and going. So learning objectives today, um, hopefully we'll be able to understand just basic terminology for LGBTQ care. Um, and then be able to make that comfortable diagnosis of referral for gender dysphoria. Um, we hope to also understand kind of our role as a medical provider to the community, um, be familiar with the care and management of both transgender patients um, as well as sexual minority patients. Um, and that usually refers to more of their sexuality. So gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, et cetera. So we'll go into all those details. Um, so I said, we're gonna start with the basics. Um, so. I like to differentiate the difference between sex and gender. So sex is what's inherent by birth. This is usually going to be your genitalia, your chromosomes, the things that we cannot change when we are first formed. Um, whereas gender is more our behavior, our culture, our gender expression. Um, that is influenced by external factors. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of these, you know, letters before. So I'd like to just touch on them briefly. So the L usually stands for lesbian. So these are women who are attracted to women. Um, gay identifies men who are primarily attracted to men. Um, but they will use this term kind of more broad spectrum as well. Bisexual individuals are individuals that are attracted to people of their own gender at birth, as well as the opposite gender. A transgender person is someone whose gender identity differ, differs from their sex at birth. And so we'll talk a little bit about that spectrum as well. Um, this specific um, graphic pulls out transsexual as separate. Um, I like to cross it out. This is outdated. We really try not to use this term. Um, you know, it usually has a negative connotation when used, um, but some of the older population will still use this term, especially if they've had gender affirming bottom surgeries. Um, and so if I said, so I said, if your patient uses the term, it's okay to use the term, but I usually don't just say use it freely. Um, queer um, is again, another umbrella term. Some people don't like to have a certain label, so they'll go by queer. It's an easy way to talk about the entire population all at once. Um, but it is also an identity that some people um, will specify. Questioning, again, we'll see a lot of this in the pediatric community, trying to figure out who they are, what they like, and just figuring out what comes with, you know, with puberty and all that. Um, intersexed individuals, these are, we'll talk about this very briefly, but these are people whose sexual anatomy does not fit the traditional female male. So these are going to be, um, you know, your Klinefelter syndrome, so your XXYs, humilarianogenesis, um, et, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. Um, and then allies are essentially people who identify with the gender they were at birth, usually, um, and they have a, your basic heterosexual identity most of the time, and they they will support the queer community. Um, asexual is another type of sexual attraction, and they usually don't feel any desire for anything at all, but that is something to acknowledge. And then pansexual, they just love everybody. So uh, we'll put it that way. They uh, All genders, all sexualities, they don't have um, a, spec you know, a specification to one or the other. Um, so this is probably one of my favorite pictures that I show all my students, um, anybody that's kind of questioning the difference between gender and sex, but this is the gender bred person. 
um, really identifies kind of the four different aspects of who we are and who we love and how we're born. So gender identity is up in the brain. Um, this is how we identify ourselves, And so it's usually a chemistry, you know, that you, it's inherent, not really inherent. It, it can change and fluctuate. That's why it's written on a, on a spectrum. So some people identify only as women. Some people only identify as male, but some people identify somewhere in the middle. Um, and this can change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some people are more set in the binary. Some people fluctuate. Um, gender expression. So that's how we dress, the clothes that we pick, the way we wear our hair, do we wear makeup? This is just how we express our gender. Um, and so again, some people may dress more feminine, some people may dress more masculine, and some people can switch clothes, you know, hour to hour if they wanted to. Your biological sex definitely is more of a binary than the spectrum allows because we usually do have XX or XY chromosomes. But again, like we talked about, there are some intersex, um, you know, abnormalities or, or intersex developments that kind of put us somewhere in the middle. And that's something to acknowledge. And then same thing with sexual orientation. So this is who we love. So this is outside of how we identify what we wear. This is just who we're physically attracted to. Um, and so heterosexual identifies people who are, who identify as the, as one gender and are attracted to that same gender. Homosexual is when you identify as a gender and you're attracted to the same gender. And then bisexual again is in that middle. But again, this can fluctuate. Everybody doesn't have to pick, you know, one of the three. Um, another just complicated picture that I like to show, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's complex. So you can, you can fill anywhere in this, you know, you can, this is just who you're attracted to here versus, you know, how you identify all in the middle. Um, but again, I like, I like the complexity of this picture. I think it really shows the complexity of, of sex and attraction and gender, um, and all that. So differences in sex development. This is the new term for intersex disorders. Um, this is kind of that general term for people who are born with reproductive sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit that typical male or female. So these are congenital. These are the way that people are born. They have no, no choice over these. Um, these can affect anywhere from sex chromosomes to just internal reproductive structures to external anatomy. Um, they can, again, correspond with any identity, any expression, um, orientation, etc. cetera. This, this is just that one part of that genderbred person that we talked about. And then, um, again, this is another biological fact that someone's body and mind may not correlate with their behavior and identity. So these are just some basic examples. I'm sure you've seen a few of these, um, but Klinefelter syndrome is kind of that big one, a mosaicism, Turner syndrome, where they only have XO, um, even something like a hypospadias or a clitomegaly, because it's not your typical idea of what that external anatomy should look like. Um, so how common, it's actually more common than we think. Um, some of them are definitely more rare, such as the partial androgen insensitivity, but things like, you know, Klinefelter syndrome or even Turner syndrome are, you know, one in a thousand births. Um, and if we think about how many deliveries happen at a hospital a year, I mean, that's at least, you know, one baby most of the time, especially at big, you know, big hospitals. Um, so to break down what transgender means, so transgender is, again, someone whose gender identity does not identify um, with the sex they were assigned at birth. And so you'll see me use these terms a lot, either F to M or female to male or M to F, which is male to female. Um, we also identify them as AFAB or AMAB, and that just stands for the assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth. Um, you'll, this is a, these are good terms to have in your dictionary so that when you're charting about somebody in the community, you can kind of use the appropriate terms without, you know, with at the same time respecting them. Um, other terms that you may see, again, transsexual, transvestite. Um, I did include IC-10 codes just, you know, when you're going to chart these. There is still an IC-10 code um, for a transsexual patient. A lot of people will reach for this one, but there is an IC-10 code for gender dysphoria, and we'll talk about that one too. Um, and then I bring up transvestite because, again, there's an IC-10 for it. If you type in trans, it probably pops up. But I like to specify that, you know, these are people who don't, I mean, they typically... This is just a gender expression. We'll put it that way. It's it's not a sexual identity. Um, it just because they wear the gender, uh, the clothing of the opposite gender, does not mean they want to be the opposite gender. Does not mean that they're attracted to the opposite gender. This is just a form of gender expression, and it's usually done for entertainment purposes. So things like drag, um, etc. 
So again, just kind of keep that um, in mind. So gender dysphoria. So again, that ICD-10 code is that F64.9, just to keep that in the back of your mind. So I start, this is, anybody can make this diagnosis, and this is from the DSM-5. This is really all you need to know. So with adolescents or adults with gender dysphoria, they have to experience at least two of the following for six months. And so that's could either be that marked incongruence between your expressed or experienced gender um, and then the one that is natal to you and that come with the secondary sex characteristics. Um, you have a strong desire to get rid of your primary or even secondary sex characteristics. You have that strong desire for the characteristics of the other gender. Um, you have a, des a strong desire to be the other gender, to be treated as the other gender, and even a strong conviction that you, the way that you react to things in life is definitely more on the opposite side of things. Um, so now for you all, in children, I'm not talking, you see adolescents, but in children, this is um, a little bit different. So you have to have at least six of the following for six months. So it's a lot, lot more in depth to make this one. Um, but again, just with how kids grow and develop their their uh, wants and needs are expressed a little bit differently. So they usually, again, have that strong desire to be the other gender. They're very insistent. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, that that they are the other gender. Um, they have a strong preference for wearing clothes typically of the other gender. They like So, for example, little girls don't want to wear dresses. Little boys don't want to wear blue. They want to wear pink, things like that. Um, they have a strong preference for cross-gender roles. So uh, either when they're playing make-believe or playing with toys, you know, they always try to say that this doll is a, a different character than, than typical. They'll actually um, reach for toys and games and activities that are usually engaged by the opposite gender that they desire to be. Um, they'll also have a strong preference for playmates of the other gender. So if you see, you know, someone who's assigned female at birth, they want to play with a lot more little boys and they're insistent they only want to play with boys, then that could be a sign um, a strong rejection of the toys, games, and activities of their assigned gender. They will express a very strong dislike of their sexual anatomy. Um, and then again, a strong desire for the physical sex characteristics that match the other, you know, their experienced gender. So again, so six of these for six months, and you can have that diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Um, so what does transitioning look like for patients? Um, and again, we'll talk about how to transition later, but transition is different for everybody. So I like to put that. Um, not everybody's going to do the same thing, but most of the time when they're transitioning, there's a social aspect. So how you're being talked to and um, experienced by your, your peers, um, there's a legal aspect, changing your name, changing your birth certificate, gender markers, licenses, social security cards, et cetera. Um, and then some people go on gender affirming hormones, and then some people will have a gender confirmation surgery or used to be known as a sex reassignment surgery. Um, or some people may do nothing at all. They say, hey, look, I'm trans, but I like who I am right now. Um, and this can change again. Everybody's going to be different. Um, so pronouns are also very big in this community. Um, so we see a lot that we see a lot more of this going on um, on social medias and emails that people are posting their pronouns. And as an ally, it's really important that you share your pronouns because then it then normalizes pronouns for everybody else. And so if everybody's doing it, we're less likely to pick out somebody from the crowd and say, oh, look, they're sharing their pronouns. Something must be different. Um, so common ones for, you know, people who identify more on the feminine side, you know, she, her, hers. That masculine side is he, him, his. And then we'll talk a bit about the non-binary. And they tend to go for they, them, theirs, or even a, the zizai, zizai here. And so you don't see that a lot. You see it definitely more in, I'd say, the queer community versus someone who identifies as the binary trans. Um, but these are just examples. And I know people struggle with the they, them, theirs a lot because, you know, how can you use a plural for a singular person? But we do it more than you realize. So, like... If you're at a mall and you see somebody all the way there, you're just like, oh, did you see Did you see them over there? Um, you're using it without realizing it when you're only just addressing one person. Um, but misgendering is huge when it comes to this, this community. Um, it's a very simple thing that can be done. Um, it's hard at the beginning, but then the more you practice it and the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, and then the non-binary gender identities, again, we'll briefly talk about these, but these are kind of those people who don't conform to any expected standards. So they're somewhere in between. They can identify as agender, so no gender at all. 
by gender, a bit of both gender fluid, where they switch back and forth, or even just a, a gender queer, like I said, is that umbrella term that they don't really know. They just, they don't feel like anything, but they don't want to assign a label to it. Um, we will talk a little bit about how to, you know, what, how they want to go through their transition if they choose to transition. A lot of times it's like a lower dosing of hormones um, and things like that. So, all right. So that's the basics. So now we're going to kind of get into what our role as the provider is, um, or as the physician as well. Um, so despite, you know, progress, there's still a lot of disparities. So this community, no matter how old they are, experience a lot of inadequate, inappropriate care, whether it's implicit bias, unconscious bias, you know, discriminatory act, or just you've never taken care of one. And so you don't know the right steps. So it's just kind of, we, there's not that education that's been there. Um, and then a lot of these community also suffer from just that disparities in mental health, behavioral health, physical health, and that makes them more likely to take those risk-taking behaviors. And so that's where providing education, like talks like this, and again, having different clinics or exposures can help. So just again, increasing the awareness and the knowledge of their health, you know, their, their health risk. Um, and then, you know, training students, training residents, you know, just to how to provide care early so that when they get into their practice, it now becomes, you know, a normal part of their day to day. Um, and then also just inspiring the younger generation to be an advocate, um, which, you know, I'm seeing a lot more of, which is which is excellent. Um, one of my favorite studies um, was an ED study um, or emergency department study done on equality. Um, essentially, about 75 percent of ED providers said you know, hey, I don't want to single somebody out, so I'm not going to ask them what their gender identity is. And plus, if I ask, they're probably not going to answer. When in reality, with the study, only about 10% of patients would actually refuse not to. Um, and the study that I saw with kiddos, actually more kiddos were more likely to tell you what their gender identity and sexual preference was. All you had to do was ask. Um, the people that are most likely not to respond are usually bisexual, bisexual males or bisexual um, females. They're the ones that are more likely not to tell you. Um, but it's really important just to, just to ask. Um, so basic steps that we can do just for inclusiveness in clinics. Um, first of all, educate your team. Do talks like this. Talk about pronouns. Talk about um, how to, you know, how to document in the charts so that there's no confusion. Try to greet everybody traditionally. So if you're walking into a new patient, um, instead of saying, hey, Mrs. So-and-so, because they have a feminine name, just kind of walk in and say, hey, I'm Dr. Peacock. You know, what name do you prefer I call you by? And just kind of start on a blank slate or just a, hey, how you doing? Um, and then also displaying that inclusive educational material. So just like we have pamphlets everywhere, make sure that you've got LGBTQ pamphlets as well. Just that little bit um, is important. Wearing pins like the one that I posted here um, on your name badge is, you know, a very simple, easy task. Um, people can choose to acknowledge it. But again, it's just a little flash that says, you know, this, this area is going to be safe for you. Um, avoiding binary language. So again, if someone comes into your clinic, you don't know who's with them. Um, you can always ask who's with them. You can refer to them just, just as a parent, um, you know, partner, spouse, when you're talking to, you know, older, older kids or adults. Um, and then, you know, use, using check boxes, if you're making your own form, I know some EMRs make it difficult. Mine is one of them. They have a set list of terms that you can use. And so I can't change that because that's how it is in our EMR. Um, but again, try asking the blunt questions to everybody. So when you're talking about sexual health, um, in your adolescence, just ask the questions, you know, if you need to kick the parent out, kick the parent out, but ask the questions to everybody, um, and make it gender inclusive. Try to do open ender, you know, open ended gender neutral questions as well. Um, that allows them to engage with you versus just saying yes and no, and then stopping the conversation there. Um, so phrases that I use a lot, I don't use the first one as much when I say I'm going to ask you these questions, um, but I do say I ask all these questions to all of my patients, regardless of age. Um, and it's, that's usually the first appointment, and then they they expect it from year to year at that point. Um, if you don't know who their sexual partners are, um, and I'm trying to figure that one out, I'll say, you know, are you sexually attracted to men, women, both? Or if they have a partner, if they've expressed they've had a partner, I confirm, is your partner assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth? Sometimes it throws the older people off, but then I explain it and they move on. 
Um, and so, and then even sperm producing and non sperm producing is a question. But again, if someone's had a vasectomy in the adult population, they get a little bit confused on that one as well. So those are just kind of ways to start incorporating that language. Um, I would say if you missed up, just apologize. They're going to be a lot more relaxed than you realize. Um, but the intent is key. So if your intent is malicious, then they're going to know that you're not actually there to try to help them. But if your intent is not malicious, it was a slip up and you quickly correct, then you're going to have a lot more, um, you know, rapport with that patient. So as a pediatric medical provider, the things that we can do importantly, and I know there's a lot of words, so I'll try to, to narrow it down, but early identification, that's the biggest thing. The earlier that you can find it, the more likely you can stop any potential adverse, you know, effect to their health. Um, this allow options for medical intervention early if we felt they're needed. But then how do we do this? It's during their well check. You know, when you have that time alone with them or even with the parent in the room, if you feel like it's a safe place to talk about it, as they're getting closer to puberty, talk about their gender identity, um, you know, upcoming puberty. Are they scared about it? What questions do they have about it? Um, I know when kids hit that that three to four range, I even ask them, you know, are you a girl or a boy? And I let them try to, you know, express it to me um, and go from there. Um, also continue to monitor for those psychosocial, you know, concerns, you know, always monitoring for the ACEs that I know that you all do. Um, but keep, just keep that, you know, on that forefront, um, again, education and support. So when a parent brings in a child to you that may start identifying in the community, you know, start helping them identify what this trajectory is going to look like, talk, talk to them about how to follow their lead. Um, the biggest thing is to support the child. And if, if you don't get anything from this lecture, that's the big thing is early, early, early support um, and making them feel loved and acknowledged. Um, and then also acknowledge the parent. This is a big change for them. And so, you know, they probably never had to do this before. This is not how they predicted their parenting journey was going to go. So acknowledge that this is new for them and that you're going to help them through it as well. Um and then when the time comes, you know, you may need to do any type of letters that help with name change, gender change, um, things like that. There's great templates out online um, that you can use. I usually just make one, save it on my computer, and then use it, you know, for everybody appropriately. And then um, appropriate referrals. So whether you feel comfortable or not, um, you know, there are referrals for mental health, depending on what's going on. There are sometimes some specialized gender clinics. I think family medicine here still has one, but I'm not sure. I'm seeing some head nods. So finding those specialized gender clinics can be really helpful. Again, referrals to, you know, surgeons um, and things like that. So um, so this is where I kind of talk about that insistent, persistent, and consistent. So the kids start to become aware of their gender, um, usually between nine months and three years old, um, and they're aware of their genitals even earlier. Um, and so we start to kind of look for these, um, these changes, these um, inconsistencies. And then gendered pronouns will usually happen around two or four. They'll, they're going to, again, start identifying what their gender is to you. And the older they get, this starts to be, you know, more consistent. Um, when they're playing make-believe, um, exploring their gender is going to be very part of normal development. Wanting to try to play with different types of toys, again, is very normal. So the idea is if, if a assigned male at birth little boy is playing with a doll, don't rip it out of his hands and say, you know, these are just for boys. Let them explore it. Um, but we all know that. But then as a child begins to identify themselves as um, either non-binary or the other gender, they're going to be insistent. They're going to tell you hands down, this is who I am. It's going to be persistent. It's not going away. It's going to continue. And then it's going to be consistent. It's, it's going to be a day-to-day -day thing from situation to situation. It's not going to change. So those are the kind of the three big things to look out for. Um, so more development here. Um, we are seeing a lot higher numbers of these children and adolescents coming in for evaluation um, and treatment for gender dysphoria and non-binary identities. Um, more kids are now trying to play with their gender expression. So they're going to be dressed and behave outside of their gender norm. So we're kind of looking for that. Um, I didn't uh, label it very well. Um, this last paragraph here, um, this was a transgender study done in 2015 about the people that are actually coming to seek care and where they feel like they're identifying as. So less than five years old of transgender patients are presenting, um, or sorry, 32% of transgender individuals are presenting less than five years old, then 28 from six to 10 years old. And then 
the older they get, the less likely they are to present with gender dysphoria. Um, but we're seeing it a lot now in these in the younger kids. Um, so, and also we see more people who are assigned male at birth express that their identity is transgender, but they don't really seek care. Um, the people who are assigned female at birth are actually seeking care more. So that's a big thing to screen for. And another thing that I found in both research and in my practice is there is a very large um, association with a transgender identity as well as a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, I see it more in my assigned male at birth patients and my trans females. Um, it's probably a good, you know, quarter to a third of my po patient population are both on the ASD spectrum as well as um, a trans female. So something to keep in the back of your mind as well um, with those comor comorbidities. Um, so psychosocial concerns, you know, these should be concerns for any child really, but people who identify in the community, um, they tend to have a more poor relationship with their parent, their caregiver, whoever is, you know, taking care of them. They're really scared of, um, family rejection, you know, loss of support, especially the older they get, you know, especially if they're, you know, middle school, high school, if they come out, are we going to be kicked out or whatnot? Um, you tend to see some more social isolation and peer rejection as well. So if they're starting to act differently, no one wants to hang out with the weird kid, right? Um, and then now that we have online communities, you know, games, things like that, we're seeing a lot of people go towards their friends online and less friends in person. Um, I have a few kiddos that I'm taking care of. And I said, well, what do you do for fun? They say, well, I talk to my friends on my Xbox. Um, I said, do you have friends in real life? And they say, nope, just my friends on my Xbox. And so... I'm like, all right, we got to figure out how to get you out um, and socializing. Um, these kids are also more likely to have any vis verbal and um, physical vi victimization. Um, this can lead to sexual assault. And then as they're older in those adolescent years, even potentially intimate partner violence. Um, again, that same decreased sense of well-being and self-esteem. With the academic and school problems, if their school is not supportive, these kids are also more likely to have... Um, more issues with their learning, their engagement, um, et cetera. So trying to get the school on board as well. Um, a lot of the kids in the community also start developing eating disorders, um, especially people who are assigned male at birth. We see a lot more because they're trying to be skinnier, maintain kind of that that skinny feminine um, body habitus, um, or even trans masculine patients, people assigned female at birth, they're trying to avoid that hit the hip growth, you know, when they're hitting puberty. So again, they'll they'll try to keep their weight low as well. But then on the other side of things, because they're socially isolated, they're not exercising, they're not getting involved. We also see that higher risk of obesity too. And then because they don't want to be obese, that can lead. So it's a vicious cycle that we're dealing with. Um, again, substance abuse um, and even just regular use in kids um, of adolescent ages. Um, and then, of course, depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicide, um, homelessness, even sexual exploitation. So one thing that they didn't know is that the closer that the transgender child or adolescence relationship is, so like parent, sibling, et cetera, um, for that negative response, the more damaging it is. So trying to keep the home, the safe space is what's really important. So... Um, we're going to kind of divide it up into two groups now. So transgender youth and then sexual minority youth. So we'll start with kind of trans youth. Um, again, the biggest thing that needs to come first is the safety and the well-being of this patient. So if this patient expresses to you in private that they might feel trans, but their parent may not be um, supportive, the question is, you know, how how can we start bridging that gap, talking to the adults or finding a safer living option um, for this for this patient if needed? Um, care again should be individualized. They should be across the board for everybody, um, community or not, but individualizing their needs, their goals, their development. Um, and then again, the appropriate referrals, if you feel like if you need to, the biggest thing now with everything going on politically is just the awareness of the state legislation. So in Tennessee, under the law of HB1, S S SB1, um, medical providers are prohibited from treating transgender youth with evidence-based, um, medical treatment, um, and any youth that was receiving care prior to this law must end that care by the end of this month, essentially. Um, this does not affect mental health care. So if they're still identifying as part of the community struggling, they can still seek out you know, care through a therapist. They just cannot do any medical interventions with hormones or surgeries um, until they turn 18 years old. So that's the biggest thing now is, well, what do we do to help, help treat these kids? Um, so... 
again, the biggest thing, that mental health approach. So these are the four kind of biggest approaches that we see parents and, and doctors taking. The best one to take is the affirming approach. So if they come to you and they say, hey, I'm the opposite gender, you say, yes, you are. What can I call you? What are your pronouns? And allowing them to start socially transitioning, whether that's clothing, haircuts, makeup, you know, anything with gender expression um, and letting them do their thing. And that kind of leads into that wait and see method. So allowing them to express their gender the way they want to and kind of see what happens because this can change as they get older. Um, the biggest thing that we try not to do is, is redirect. And so some people will try to redirect that behavior away. So they'll say, well, maybe you should only be this at home and change your name at school and go by your, you know, your, your normal name at school. Um, you know, they'll, they'll try to redirect it. They'll, they'll try to push them into more of the gender specific activities. Um, and they try to kind of force it on them. But then we also used to see reparative therapy. This is now illegal in many communities. Um, but this was that conversion therapy that was really big in the religion, um, religious and conservative communities. So again, affirming therapy is the best way to do it. And then um, wait and see is also okay, because you're not really discouraging it, but you're letting them take that role, you're following the lead. So when do we start referring kids? Um, when they start seeing issues with coexisting anxiety, depression, even suicidal thoughts, that's the time to get them in with a good mental health provider. Um, again, another affirming way to let them know that this is okay and we're going to help you through it. Um, or if they want any additional support, resources, um, a lot of communities will have, um, you know, groups where a lot of transgender kiddos can get together, have a, that social group with other kids like them. Um, letting parents know about PFLAG, which is a parent parental group for um, the LGBTQ community. Um, there's usually one in, in most communities. So trying to find that additional support. Um, and then if they're not gender dysphoric, but then what do we do to kind of go forward to, to plan for treatment in the future? Because that gender dysphoria can come in at any time. Um, and then even caregivers who are uncomfortable. So the caregivers also need a safe space. So that's where we can come in too, is if the caregiver is struggling with how to support their, their transgender child, we can say, okay, well now let's go to therapy for you so that you can start expressing your concerns in, in a safe way as well. Um, so phenotypic interventions. So these are how we change the way that we look. Um, so the first one that we can do for, for kids that doesn't involve any um, you know law breaking here in Tennessee would be social transition. This is fully reversible. Um, it just allows that youth to live, you know, partially or completely as their asserted gender. Um, so that's again, the hairstyle, the clothing pronouns, um, and then even a new name, if that's what they would like. Um, and so we can do this as a provider by helping them come up with plans on how we can, you know, introduce them to family and friends, how to help the school and the school staff, you know, address, adjust to their new name and how to create a more, um, safe environment, whether it's a bathroom situation, um, a bullying situation, et cetera. So again, that safety plan. Um, and then again, back to the providing the medical documentation when needed. And then once they're old enough, prior to the HB1, SB1 would be a hormonal transition. So puberty blockers um, in some states are still allowed, um, or even depending on their age, the initiation of those gender affirming hormones. And then kind of that last step is surgical transition. So I always like to ask, you know, when people come into me, what surgeries are you thinking about? Have you thought about surgeries? Um, and usually they have an idea of, you know, do they want to go forward with any right now or whatnot? Um, making referrals when this, you know, when appropriate, that early intervention, because again, if puberty blockers were still allowed, you could intervene earlier and usually prevent some, um, you know, top surgeries or, you know, different things like that in, um, especially the trans masculine patients. Um, I know the biggest thing people were concerned about were gender, uh, genital surgeries. These usually don't happen until they reach the age of maturity um, and going into, you know, 16, 17, 18, or even older, uh, mainly just because of how the surgeries are performed in the tissue that's needed. Um, chest surgeries were really the only big surgery that was done prior to the age of 18 um, in the trans masculine youth um, because of gender dysphoria. So those are kind of what transition can look like. You've got social, hormonal, and then surgical. Um, and I know I mentioned that social was reversible. Puberty blockers are also reversible. 
um, gender affirming hormones. We'll talk about what's reversible and what's not. And then surgical transition is obviously not reversible. Um, so hormonal interventions look very different. So one, we can usually suppress puberty. Um, again, as I said, fully reversible. Um, that's usually done with GNRH analogs. And then the other option would be to do gender affirming hormones, which then would promote the desired secondary sex characteristic. And that's done with the cross gender hormone, whether it's testosterone or estradiol. Um, and again, this is partially reversible. And I always make sure that's really important that the youth and the caregivers are fully informed on risks and benefits. They're reversed about, you know, how able, how, how they can be reversed um, and not if possible. I think that's really important to talk about what's going to change and what's not. Um, so puberty suppression, the idea is usually to start around Tanner stage two. Um, there's really no need to start any earlier than that. Um, but Tanner stage two is ideal. Um, and this just helps stop the development of secondary sex characteristics. So this stops, um, you know, the elongation and growth of testes and penises stops the breast development. Um, and sometimes even, and even, um, periods in the assigned female at birth patients. Um, but it also allows them more time to get better clarification on what their gender identity is and what their degree of gender dysphoria is. Um, and then if they decide that they want to stop, then then they can stop it and their puberty just naturally takes over from there. Um, so this also allows them to live more of their affirmed gender without going through a puberty. Um, and then with trans masculine patients, so people assigned female at birth, it allows them to almost go through puberty the same way that a that a natal male would, which is which is excellent for them. Um, and then also when it comes to surgery, a lot of times if you can do puberty blockers, it makes surgeries easier later on. So, um, so like I said, Tanner stage two is ideal. If they get to Tanner stage three or four, um, this would help prevent any further changes. Um, and then from there, you could still start cross hormones if you wanted to. So in that transmasculine patient, I know I've mentioned it allows for the suppression of menses when using lower doses of testosterone, so they can mature at that same rate as their peers. And then trans feminine, they get a far more superior testosterone blocker. And again, also allows for lower doses of the estradiol if needed. Um, so suppressing regimens, I think it's important to note that there are no standardized regimens. Um, most, most of the time we use the GNRH analogs, which would be the histrelin um, implanted in the arm, usually changed every 12 months. But you can also go into the Luprolide. Um, there's one month, three month, and six month formulations that you can do for injections for these patients. Um, so that's how we usually suppress. And then there's also other anti-androgens anti and anti-estrogens that we can use as well. But typically the long-acting ones are the more, more well-tolerated. Um, plus it's easier for the kids to stay on them because they don't have to take pills every single day. Um, but it's going to be different for everybody. Once they get to kind of the right age, so that's usually around 15, 16, um, starting those cross hormones or gender affirming hormones. So these will help them develop their secondary sex characteristics that they're desiring. Um, the biggest thing to look out for in the trans feminine patient is any type of tumor that may be estrogen sensitive. Um, again, those are super low risk in, in small people, um, but risk for blood clots, any type of liver dysfunction. And then the transmasculine, again, same thing, a testosterone sensitive tumor, um, a pre-existing polycythemia, and then again, liver dysfunction. So like I said, typically start around age 16. Um, and then routine monitoring usually includes testosterone, estradiol, renal function, liver function, A1C, and lipids. Um, and then usually the first year that I see patients, I usually see them every three months. And then after the first year, every six months that I do these labs. Um, trans feminine regimens typically involve the 17 beta estradiol. There are different ways of doing that. So there's oral, sublingual, topical, injectable, and even pellets. Again, pellets are when people are on a, st a steady dose, um, and they're on it a little bit longer. Um, the biggest thing that we're looking for is we're looking for that redis the redistribution of body fat, decrease in muscle mass, a skin softening. Um, they usually have a little bit decrease in their sexual desire, um, 
So sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad for people, but we tend to see those breast growth, a decreased testicular volume. Um, the older they get, we worry about, you know, decreased sperm production if they want to have their own children. And again, we'll talk about that here in just a bit. Um, and then there are no voice changes, unfortunately, um, especially if you start after puberty um, and their voice is already dropped. Um, you can also add testosterone blockade if you need to. So say they came to you later, um, they're too old for the GRH agalogs, then you would do an estradiol and a testosterone blockade. So spironolactone was kind of number one um, used, followed by a finasteride. But now that biclutamide is generic, it's a much um, it's a much better testosterone blockade, um, and it's cheap now, which is nice. Um, transmasculine usually involves some type of testosterone, so testosterone cypionate or ethanotate. Um, a gel organ pellets. And the things that we start seeing with them is more skin oil, more acne, facial hair, body hair. They start to get that male pattern, baldness, um, increased muscle tone, a fat redistribution, periods go away. Um, and then we do see some bottom change as well um, and that deepening of the voice. And this is just kind of that onset to the time that we start to see the maximum effect. And then after that, I say you just kind of age naturally. Um, so fertility um, considerations when we get into people who are sexually active, um, remember that these cross hormones are not birth control. Um, it is still possible to get pregnant. Um, so when talking with a transmasculine youth, if they still have a partner who's sperm producing or assigned male at birth, we talk about different ways to prevent pregnancies um, on top of condoms. Usually I go for more of a progesterone base, whether that's just the mini pill or trying to get one of the longer acting IUDs or the arm implants. Um, is very, very helpful for these patients. And progesterone only won't affect their hormones. Um, and then just talking about puberty, if we start GnRH agonists early, um, they are more likely to not develop um, viable sperm or oocytes. So things to remember if they want to have their own children in the future, um, probably waiting to start transition is probably safer. Um, but these adults have had to um, genetic children successfully um, as well. So then surgical interventions. Um, so again, these are now referred to as gender affirming surgeries. Um, so typically we see male reconstruction, um, chest, breast augmentation, and then genital reconstruction. If anything is done before 18 years old, um, when laws allowed, it does require extensive documentation, extensive um, kind of psychiatric and psych psychological um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, evaluations. That's the word. Um, so it's not something that's taken lightly. Um, so then sexual developments. Now we're going to talk about more of the sexuality of things. So again, remember, these are independent um, objects. They do both evolve very rapidly during that adult and um, adolescent and young adult years. Um, again, prior to puberty, you might see them start talking, you know, experimenting with under gender play and expression. But again, this does not predict their sexual orientation. That is something completely different than their gender. Um, usually people can start being more aware of their sexual orientation around nine or 10 years old. So they might be able to start expressing these things to you. Um, they might explore their attractions through play, fantasies, behaviors. Um, and some will keep these private. Some are a little bit more open with them. Um, but again, sexual identity does not always dictate sexual behavior. So just remember that. Um, and so, again, when someone has a different sexual preference, um, these are the things that we kind of run into. And it's very similar to the transgender youth. So the lack of acceptance, the family rejection leading to depression, um, the family acceptance, the, you know, the more accepting we have, the better we feel about ourselves. So if we're not being accepted and loved, the worse we're going to feel about ourselves. Um, and then healthcare providers can provide that safe space for these people. So it's really important that you try to keep your biases aside if you have any and just provide them with the support they need. Always looking out for victimization, violence, again, um, especially gay, you know, gay males may be more likely to be sexually abused. Um, so we keep an eye on that. Again, tobacco and substance abuse, unstable housing, STIs, unplanned pregnancies, these are all things that we have to worry about um, as they get into those adolescent years. Um, this is just one of those, um, oh Lord, the words are leaving me today. Um, but these are the things that we're looking for when we're caring for these sexual minoritized youth. So we're looking for what strengths do they have, how safe is their home life, um, 
you know, where are they at in school? How far do they get in school? Is their job safe? Are they keeping an employment? What activities are they into? Do they use drugs? Do they use alcohol, tobacco? Um, are they depressed? Are they thinking about self-harm, safety? And then again, their sexual, their sexuality, just ask. Um, they'll, they'll tell you most of the time. Don't, have, don't um, assume that just because a female comes in asking for birth control that they're sexually active with a male, they could just have really bad periods. Um, normalize the process, you know, let, you know, just kind of talk to it very normally. And then if you're kind of, if they're not being open, ask more specific questions. The more open-ended they are, the more specific, the more likely that you'll get the answer that you want. Um, STI screening, again, should be performed based on sexual activity and not orientation. Um, I believe starting at age 16 is when the USPTF starts recommending annual chlamydial gonorrheal screening. Um, you can add syphilis and HIV if they are sexually active. Um, if someone tests positive, then you should screen them more often. Um, from there, um, you can add Hep A and Hep B immunization, uh, or sorry, Hep A and Hep B testing if they're not immunized, and if they are not immunized, get them get them their vaccines. Um, and then same thing with hep C that should be added to men who have sex with men. And that's what the MSN is. Um, if they have both same sex and opposite sex partners, if they're using, un, you know, no protection, whether it's vaginal or anal penetrative sex, you know, if they, again, they test positive on their STI screen for hep C, that's the big one. Um, cervical cancer screening usually is not initiated before 21 years old. Now, if they do have HIV and they're younger than 21, you do start this cervical cancer screening upon the age that they're diagnosed with HIV. Um, real quick, just PrEP and PEP. Um, these are ways that we can prevent HIV. Um, so these are behavioral. So behavioral interventions are always first line, you know, using a barrier um, protection, um, avoiding condoms that are lubricated with the 9 oxonil 9 um, That's actually a lubrication that can... Um, wear it, like wear down the protection. Um, it can also cause more friction, which makes more micro traumas, which increases the risk for HIV. Um, and then again, appropriate toy hygiene is important. And then for people who have um, herpes, you can use valcyclovirus prophylaxis. Um, so PrEP um, is pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you're going on that antiviral before someone has HIV. Um, there are two ways to do it. There's amtrigabine, tenofovir, alfinamide, and then amtrigabine, tenofovir, dysproxyl. Um, the second one it has a generic option, um, and so that's usually going to be the cheaper option. That generic option has also been studied in people assigned female at birth, whereas the first one has not been studied in people assigned female at birth. So you have to think about that when you're picking one of these medicines for the PrEP. But it's a daily pill. Um, in the pediatric population or the adolescent population, it is weight-based up to 35 kilograms. Once they hit 35 kilograms, it's a single dose for everybody. Um, and then you just take it every day, um, which makes it really easier. But say someone is not on PrEP, they have an exposure. Um, you can do post-exposure prophylaxis. This is approved up to 13 years and older. Um, and you use the generic option that I talked about, um, starting within 72 hours of that intercourse and you take it every day for 28 days. Um, these can decrease your risk of contracting HIV by about 99%. It's like 99.91 or something like that. It's, it's a big decrease. Um, and then you can also use doxycycline for chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, post-exposure prophylaxis as well. Did not put that one in there. And then the last big thing, um, immunizations. No different than, than your normal kid. Just try to get them as vaccinated as possible. But the ones that are really, really important are going to be your Hep A, your Hep B, your HPV, and your meningitis. Um, obviously, there's a lot more. So the moral of the story is that the kids who can live as their authentic selves and feel safe and loved and accepted are going to have much better health outcomes altogether. So a little bit of my story. Um, I was that kid that when I was three, I told my mom and my dad, I'm a boy, my genitals are going to change when I get older. And they said, no, it's not. Um, but ultimately they did the kind of wait and see method. Um, and I started transitioning my last year of medical school. So, um, and I never want to be a princess. I was always a ninja, just in case you're wondering.